Picture the sanctuary where you grew up. For many of us, it was a synagogue. For others, maybe not. Maybe you had some other sacred space in your life. Picture that space. Close your eyes if you feel comfortable. Do you remember the walls? What color were they? Was there carpet? Was it patterned? Do you remember the lighting fixtures? Perhaps there was an arc, maybe with doors, maybe with curtains. Were there windows? How high? Where in the room might they be? At the front or on the sides? Could you see outside, or was the glass frosted, or even stained glass? If it was stained glass, do you remember the pattern or the colors? Picture yourself sitting, looking out that window. What do you see? One of my favorite teachings in Judaism has to do with sanctuary construction. In a seemingly random comment in the Talmud, Rabbi Yochanan says that one may only pray in a sanctuary with windows. That's it. One line, but one that speaks to the core of Jewish practice and one that should orient us to how we live as Jews in the world. Why must our prayer spaces have windows? Because we are not an insular community. What we do in this room cannot be limited to this room. We Jews have always been instructed to engage and participate in the world around us. Windows allow us to see out into the community where what is happening in the world matters to us and we to it. Perhaps this year, that lesson is more important than ever before. After everything that we've experienced this year, we would be justified in drawing the metaphorical curtains closed and sheltering ourselves within our sanctuaries. This year has been a challenging one for Jews in America and certainly around the world as well. As a global Jewish community, we have been dealt heartbreak after heartbreak and endured a year filled with more communal loss than many of us could have ever imagined. In 1982, Rabbi David Hartman published an article called Auschwitz or Sinai. In it, he discusses two options for the way that we can see the world as Jews. And while he wrote specifically about the state of Israel following Israel's first war in Lebanon, His words have a poignant resonance to us in 2024. He wrote in words that echo for us this Kol Nidre evening, we have again become a traumatized nation. The ugly demonic forces of anti-Semitism have horrified our sensibilities. We must never forget the destruction of Jews. Hartman calls this the Auschwitz mentality the idea that the Holocaust is the dominant event in modern Jewish history, shaping our thoughts and the future of the Jewish people. And this year, I couldn't really blame any of us for thinking that way. In some ways, we've needed to cover our proverbial windows and look inward. It has been a year of discomfort and fear as we struggle with our Jewish identities and beliefs. Many of us, myself included, have felt forced to approach our Judaism a little bit differently, our politics a little bit differently, and our lives a little bit differently. But Hartman proposes a second model, Sinai Judaism. When the Israelites gathered at Mount Sinai to receive Torah, we read that we all heard God's voice and that we all committed to that covenant with God. This represents a pivotal crucial moment in all of Jewish history, 
Until this moment, God spoke through one human emissary, Moses. Now, all of the Jewish people, all of us, are responsible for carrying out God's vision for a just society here on earth. And we are taught it wasn't just our ancestors long ago. Tradition teaches that each and every one of us were there at Sinai. Each of us carry this responsibility today. To live the covenant of Sinai is to embrace the vision of Judaism moving forward, a guiding principle for how we each can live now in our world. Rabbi Hartman believed in 1982 that our window shades should not be drawn shut, and I believe they should not be drawn shut in 2024 either. Rather than living our lives only oriented by Auschwitz or October 7th or Jewish suffering of any kind, the expression of the covenant at Sinai, that eternal covenant, should guide how we act and live as Jews in the world. Sinai calls us to action, to moral awakening, to living constantly with the challenge of building a moral and just society which can mirror the kingdom of God. Hartman also insisted that we should not see ourselves only as victims. Jewish suffering did not create self-pity, but rather moral sensitivity. And you shall love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Sinai compels us to look out those windows into the world and to act, to use Judaism as a framework for how we live. There is a story of the Chazon Ish, a late 18th century Orthodox rabbi who was once asked for advice. A man explained to the rabbi that he did not have enough money to pay his taxes and therefore would not be allowed to vote in an upcoming election. The rabbi responded to the man saying, sell your tefillin and pay your taxes. Tefillin you can borrow from another, but the right to vote you cannot get from anyone else. I love this story. And I love it for more reasons than just that there is an election in 25 days. This story is about the crucial lesson of not surrendering our voices in the public sphere. We have a voice. Judaism has a voice. It is loud and it is clear. Judaism is not agnostic about how we should live in this world. Sinai calls us forward to listen to the voices of our tradition and to act. On Yom Kippur, we hear the voice of the prophet Isaiah. In one of my favorite biblical passages, the prophet forcefully reminds us that God is not looking for a perfect fast day. Merely praying and afflicting ourselves is not sufficient. It must be coupled with real work outside these windows. No, this is the fast I desire, Isaiah commands us, to share your bread with the hungry, to free those who are oppressed, and to clothe the naked. Each year, we read these words as a reminder that the internal work we do in this space cannot happen in a vacuum. It must be coupled with action to help those around us, and this community shows up in that way beautifully. You saw, hopefully, when you arrived this evening, our food truck, which we hope to fill completely with food to bring to Gillespie Center and Homes with Hope. And tomorrow, one of our afternoon offerings will be to make food for Mercy Learning Center, which provides free literacy and life skills education to low-income women in the greater Bridgeport area. I encourage you to help us live the words of Isaiah and contribute to one of these projects. On Yom Kippur, we hear the voice of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. Heschel will always be known as a prolific scholar and thinker, but his rabbinate was one that was steeped in action. When Heschel marched in Selma with Dr. King, he famously proclaimed that he felt like his feet were praying. Judaism impels us to act to bring about the world in which we want to live. And this action makes us more holy, brings us closer to God. This community knows that better than most. 
in June of 1964 when Dr. King invited members of the Central Conference of American Rabbis to join him in what he called creative witness to equality and racial justice, one of the rabbis who responded was T.I.'s first full-time rabbi, B.T. Rubenstein. Rabbi Rubenstein turned and looked out the windows on this bima. He saw injustice and he decided to act. He, along with 16 other rabbis, ventured down to Florida to respond to Dr. King's request. They took part in a protest outside Monson's restaurant in St. Augustine, a city to which the governor had ordered a 150-man special police force to deal with these protests. When Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, who was protesting alongside the rabbis, was assaulted by one of these officers, a rabbi stepped in front of him then another, and then another, until eventually each was detained. Crammed together inside a tiny jail cell, the rabbis penned a letter that night entitled, Why We Went. They talked about how Judaism guided their actions and in fact compelled them to act at all. We came as Jews who remember the millions of faceless people who stood quietly watching the smoke rise from Hitler's crematoria we came because we know that second only to silence, the greatest danger to man is the loss of faith in man's capacity to act. These rabbis invoked Auschwitz to justify Sinai. Hauntingly, they signed that letter from jail with the blessing that we have been praying each and every Shabbat since October 7th for our hostages in Gaza. Baruch Ata Adonai, Matir Asurim. Blessed are you, God, who frees the captive. They weren't praying for themselves, but rather for the liberation of American citizens, seemingly free, but held down and suppressed by systems designed to maintain power among the few at the expense of certain minorities. And on Yom Kippur, we also hear the voice of Torah. Another response to the question of why we have windows in our sanctuaries is so that we can see who we've left out. In the morning, we'll read the following words from our Torah. Atem nitzavim hayom kuchem. You stand this day before God, all of you. Who are we willing to include in that word kuchem, all of you? Here, too, Judaism is unambiguous about our directive. Our Torah explains that everyone, from the woodchopper to the water drawer, is a part of the community in the eyes of God. The voice of Torah calls out to each of us to create a society in which all of us can contribute. One way we can do this is through the ballot box using our voices to strive for a country which most lives up to these ideals in our Torah. Dr. King said in 1967, the church must be reminded that it is not the master or servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. If the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club without any moral or spiritual authority. The voice of Torah calls each of us to be that conscience, conscience, claiming its moral authority to help create the most just, inclusive, and morally sound version of this country. If we want to create a society in which all of us are seen and heard and valued from the woodchopper to the water drawer, that means creating a nation in which we value the divine spark of God in each person, no matter where they came from or how much money they have. A nation in which each of us has access to the health care we need to live our fullest lives, no matter in which state we live. A nation that values and supports a strong and democratic state of Israel and supports her right to defend herself. A nation in which every person is seen as an important contributing member of society, no matter who they voted for in the last election. In just 25 days, or nine if you vote early here in Connecticut, we will each have the opportunity to use our voice to try and shape this nation to be one that is a little bit more closely resonant 
with the voice of Isaiah, the voices of Heschel and Rubenstein and King, and the voice of our Torah. As Rabbi Hartman teaches us, the moral and spiritual aspirations of the Jewish tradition were not meant to be realized in sermons or by messianic dreamers who wait passively on the margins. Torah study is not a substitute for actual life, nor are prayer and the synagogue escapes from the complexities of political life. Our tradition speaks to the present just as much as it speaks to the past and the future. So, let us look out the windows of this beautiful sanctuary and see the realities of the world around us so that we can create a nation worthy of its values and the values of our tradition. Judaism is meant to be used, to be lived, to help build that nation, to help build that world. Keni hiratzon. May it be so.